All right, so here we go today talking about electrolytes. We've already learned that electrolytes are chemicals that help conduct electricity in solution. I've already done this demonstration before, but now it should have more meaning, okay? We're gonna apply this to a solution, but at this point in time, the word electrolyte means a property we've already learned by ionic compounds. For instance, if I have sodium chloride, sodium chloride is NaCl. It's a metal and a nonmetal. When I write solid, what that means is I must have an arrangement of ions in a crystal lattice. This sodium ion is attracting this chloride ion, and we have this chloride ion attracting a sodium ion, and this is what ionic solids look like. They make something called crystals. This positive ion, we have a negative ion, positive ion, positive ion is, the, is, the, is the metal, the negative ion is the nonmetal. Now, of course, it's not quite this simple. This sodium will be surrounded by another chlorine ion, another chlorine ion, one in front, one behind. This will be surrounded by six other sodiums. You have to know that when you make ionic compounds, because these attraction between the ions are so strong, they're solids. Now, what we've already learned is that because the ions are locked in this fixed position, they can only vibrate in their fixed positions, they cannot conduct electricity. Con con uh, electricity is conducted by two methods. What are those methods again? Free ions or in aqueous, but there's another example of, of conducting electricity. Free ions or free electrons. Metals have free electrons so they're able to hold them loosely and charges can be conducted by a metal in any phase because electrons are loose. But in a salt, which is something we've learned in terms of ionic compound, these salts cannot conduct because the ions in this phase are not free. This is a very important. Second time I'm doing this because now I'm, I'm giving you more information. If, in fact, I had a negatively charged object right here, this charge could be conducted over here if the positives would move toward it and the negatives repelled. If they could move out of the crystal. They cannot, so it doesn't conduct. So solid ionic compounds, as we have been dealing with, cannot conduct electricity. Now, We've got Ernie again here, and Ernie lights up in the presence of two metals. We should have two metals con conducting each other, and in this case, it's not about ions. It's about the electrons that are free in this aluminum electrode. Now, we know that metals hold on to electrons loosely, so you should understand that the conduction of electricity in a solid metal, unlike an ionic compound, is done because, well, in a metal, you have these electrons that are loosely held. In a very simplistic case, if I have a negatively charged object, what that does is it repels this electron, which this one will repel this one, and repels this one. And all of a sudden, we've made the charge move from one side to the other because of the mobility of electrons. Now, that is different than the ionic compound. So if I have copper, if I have iron, if I have aluminum, they're great conductors of heat and electricity because their electrons are free to move. Things that are nonmetals above the staircase, they hold on electrons too tightly, so they're not free to repel. That's what we call things that are nonmetals, what? Great insulators. Right, a styrofoam cup, anything that makes up a thermos, the rubber around a wire, the insulation in your home, we're all made of substances, they're non-metals. They hold down electrons so tightly, they can't move. All of this, my friends, is review. But we're gonna build upon this today. So we're gonna be stuck here with the idea about ionic compounds not conducting the solid. And of course, I can prove that to you as I've done before. Take sodium chloride, table salt, okay? 
pour it, make a little pile here. All right. And I put my two electrodes, and as of I've hit them before, you can see that the two metals conduct because the free electrons. But if I put these two in a solid, Ernie doesn't light up. Stick them in a solid. Why? The ions are not free. So, if I was to take this salt, okay, and add some water to it and dissolve it, I'll be able to dissolve it. I'm sorry, able to conduct electricity because of the ability of these ions to be free. So if I drop these in water and let water be the solvent. So take some water and put the electrodes in, we should see that there's gonna what's gonna happen. Nothing is correct. Water without any ions does not conduct electricity. So, water is a terrible electrolyte. Okay, there are ions in here, but not enough. Now, if I was to add some of this table salt and put this into the solution and stir with a stirring rod, because NaCl is aqueous, how do I know it's aqueous? I have a solubility guideline. What do we know? Chlorides are soluble. There are some exceptions, but sodium is not one of them. Or, sodium is a group one ion. So for two reasons, sodium chloride is soluble. Now what does that mean? That means, before I get this, it means, and it's something we've learned, it means that you've got to visualize this. It means the following. It means that water, if I change this to aqueous, and I add some water, I've just made a solution. And what, that's AQ, I can do this. So aqueous means I've just dissolved and the ions are free now. I guess I should have not free before. So now they're free. Why? Because the water, the solvent, the negative part of the water will surround this sodium ion. In fact, a bunch of them will surround the sodium ion. I call these famous boyfriend, famous girlfriend attractions. And water gets, surrounds this sodium ion so much that it cannot feel the chloride ions and it's pulled away as a free ion. So the aqueous means we have these molecule ion attractions that pull it away. And when it's free, and now we have ions that can move, Ernie should light up. And thus we call it an electrolyte. Okay, now that isn't very bright. Okay, so what can I do to increase the ability to conduct? Add more free ions, as long as they dissolve and they are soluble which means the ions are free. Are all salts soluble? No. So it means some of them don't break apart into free ions. So as I add more salt to this, assuming it dissolves, as Jenny says, then my solution should be a better conductor. So more ions and Ernie should be brighter. Not a heck of a lot more, but a little bit more. Okay? Now, so what is an electrolyte? An electrolyte is something that breaks apart into ions. Very important. So we put the word electrolyte. All right? Electrolyte. And you should know it means something that makes free ions. And free ions do what with electricity? Conduct. So, this table we've been studying, table F, if something is soluble, what kind of electrolyte is it? A poor one or a very good one? If it's soluble, if it breaks apart into ions, like sodium chloride, is it a good electrolyte or is it a weak electrolyte? It's a good one. 
The more ions you break apart, solubility means the ability to break apart into free ions. If you're insoluble, you don't. Now, just because, remember this, just because you dissolve, don't think you make free ions. Now, there's some things listed on here, as you know, that are not ionic in nature. So here's water again. Notice water is covalent in nature. Why is water covalent in nature? Water is covalent in nature because it's made up of what? What is water made up of? It's made up of nonmetals. Nonmetals bonded to nonmetals are called covalent. In fact, you've got a special word for things that are covalent. We call them molecular. So things that are molecular, are they electrolytes? Sugar. Okay, let's look at sugar. Sugar or glucose, glucose is an example, C6H12O6. This is glucose. Simple form of sugar. Is it an electrolyte? Is this an electrolyte? Got the L in the wrong spot, but you get the idea. Someone said no, why? Right, and that's very big to understand here. Is an electrolyte? The answer is no. It does not break apart into ions. Do not think that this carbon, this hydrogen, and I'm forgetting six oxygens, okay, so I'm C6H12O6, okay. Don't, do not think that this breaks apart into free atoms Okay, so molecular compounds don't have positive and negative. They didn't transfer electrons. This is all review. So if I've got pure water, okay, we know pure water doesn't conduct very well. It's not a good electrolyte. It's molecular. It doesn't have ions. Or if it does, in truth, it does have some, but they're too low in quantity to conduct electricity. Now, if I add some sugar, now, Sugar is polar, so will it dissolve? Like dissolves like. So add a lot of sugar. Whoa. Okay, add a lot of sugar. Dissolve it. It will dissolve because sugar is polar. Is that still with the salt in it? There's no salt in this one. It's just pure water. So dissolve. There's a lot of sugar. Sugar is an electrolyte. Well, if it's an electrolyte, okay, it will conduct. It does not conduct electricity because, as Tahira says, it doesn't make any what? Free ions. Of course it dissolved, but there's no free ions. So things that are electrolytes do not break apart into free ions. They do not conduct electricity. You have to be a salt. But not only a salt or ionic, you have to be what? Soluble, correct. You have to be soluble, OK? now. What are we learning today? Well, we're going to learn something about colligative properties. Colligative properties have to be aware of our electrolytes and our non-electrolytes. Let me explain. There are two basic forms of colligative properties that we know. Now, colligative properties are properties of the solvent that change when you add solute particles. So here we go. So our first, let's go into a new page. Colligative properties, that's what today is about. Now, colligative properties are properties of the solvent. Okay? Now, collig means many. Colligative properties talks about how the solvent's properties change when you dissolve something into them, okay? How the properties change of the solvent once you put something into them. Now, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at what happens to the boiling point. And what happens to the freezing point. when we add solute particles to water. What's the boiling point of water at standard conditions? 
Boiling point at one atmosphere of pressure of water in Celsius. 100 degrees Celsius. What's the boiling point of the freezing point of water at one atmosphere of pressure? Zero degrees Celsius. Now, my friends in chemistry, when I have pure water, nothing mixed in, water boils at 100, the pressure on it is one atmosphere. The freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius if nothing is mixed with the water at one atmosphere. But this changes when I add particles to a solution. And how it changes is what you're responsible for understanding. So let's look at a couple animations before I talk about how to solve some of these problems. Okay, now, here we go. Here is boiling. Now, if you look at boiling, maybe, that didn't go very good. So here's boiling. You see some molecules doing what? Escaping and coming back. Oops, I got the wrong one up. Let me start it for a minute. I got the wrong one. This is the one I want. Okay, look. Some molecules are evaporating. Some molecules are what? Here comes evaporation, condensation. Uh, oh, evaporation, condensation. Now, what things were happening? The rate of condensation was equal to the rate, look, watch guys. Oops, can't do it. We had some evaporation and condensation. So we would say is we're at equilibrium. As fast as some evaporate, some condense back into a liquid because of the stoppered bottle. So because of the stoppered bottle, the rate of evaporation eventually equals the rate of condensation. What can you say about the number of molecules up here? They stay pretty constant. We'll learn that in the next unit. So notice, between the two phases, liquid and gas, you have movement both ways. You had some evaporation and condensation. Now, let's count how many molecules we have here. One, two, three, four, five. Five of them. Now, watch what happens when I add solute particles. The solute particles are in the red now. Now watch the difference. Make some observations. Okay, I have some evaporation, condensation. I have some condensation. More condensation. More condensation. What was happening here? Which side was clearly affected? Which movement? The condensation was affected or was the boiling affected? Watch again. My friends in chemistry, these red spheres represent solute particles. It could be sugar, it could be sodium ions, it doesn't matter. What, what do you think these red dots were doing? Watch it again, I'm not gonna tell you. Come on, make observations. Watch. Not that one. Christmas in July. Watch. What's being impeded? There's some evaporation, there's some condensation. There's some more condensation. What's happening? More condensation. Someone talk to me. What's happening? What's happening? I showed you one where you had movement both ways, right? When you didn't have the solute particles, you had condensation, you had evaporation. But now with the solute particles, what are they doing? The condensation keeps going, but the boiling is what? The boiling is being stopped. These solute particles are getting in the way of the water from getting to the surface. I have enough energy. I want to escape the hydrogen bonds of the water. That's the attractive force. We learned that. But I must get to the surface. These solute particles, this could be sugar, it could be salt, are getting in the way. If they're getting in the way, they're making it tough on me to get to the surface and evaporate. In fact, the vapor pressure, which is the force of liquid molecules, is going down. There was less molecules evaporating because this stuff was getting in the way. If you ever had boiling water and you threw salt on boiling water when you're cooking, 
you watch the boiling stop for a few seconds, don't you? Why? By adding the salt particles, you prevented the water from getting to the surface. Eventually, you add enough heat for these guys to circumvent. So, we call this boiling point elevation. The vapor pressure, the rate of evaporation drops. So therefore, to get to boiling, remember what, the, remember what boiling was? Boiling was when the pressure upward equals the pressure pushing down. Remember I stood on the desk to show you that? Okay, remember I lowered the pressure above a liquid and you saw the water boil at room temperature? All the stuff we've learned already, we're just building on. Now, by adding salt particles here, you're making it tougher for the water to evaporate. So it needs more energy to boil. So therefore, its boiling temperature is raised. Anytime you add solute particles and dissolve something soluble into a solution, the boiling point temperature is elevated. We call it boiling point elevation. And the reason is you need more energy to get around these particles to create the same vapor pressure upward that matches the downward. The pressure on this stays the same, but the pressure upward drops when these guys get in their way. So you need more heat to overcome that. Does anyone know where we use this? Where do we use this in our life? We talk about these, these animations and everything else. Where do we see this? Where boiling point is elevated. You guys came to work on a bus. Came, maybe maybe you didn't go to work here, but maybe you came on a bus to go to school, okay? Or you came by car. Internal combustion engines require to be cooled. We have we're exploding gasoline in the piston. A lot of heat's being released when we burn gasoline in our engine. If we didn't have a coolant system, the heat released by the gasoline burning would melt the iron into the iron. It's called a frozen engine or a seized engine. That's why you have oil, but you need a coolant system. So we have liquid coolant that gets pumped to the engine and pumped back to the radiator to exchange the heat. We take the heat away from the internal combustion engine. We call it coolant. We bring it to the radiator, wind hits the radiator with high surface area, cools it, brings that cool liquid back to the what engine, takes the heat away, transfers it. We have a liquid that takes heat away from the engine. Do we want that liquid to boil? The answer would be no, because if a liquid boils, you produce pressure. Pressure produces gas. Gas blows out lines, and you're that guy or girl on the side of the road doing this to their overheated engine, okay? So we use coolant. It has what? A higher boiling point. Why? Adding stuff to water makes the boiling point so high, it's harder for you to reach the boiling point. Now you notice, the more stuff I added, the better it conducted. Well, the more stuff I add to this, the more it raises the boiling point. The more you need more heat to overcome the obstacles. If you live in a hot environment like Arizona, you have to have a more concentrated coolant in your car fluid to prevent it from boiling. The boiling point is raised, so it's harder to get there. That's called boiling point elevation. You're responsible for knowing the boiling point gets elevated. You need more heat to overcome these obstacles. The more stuff you add, of course, the more energy you need to boil, so the boiling point gets elevated. Now let me ask you this question. If I had a mole of sugar, and a mole of NaCl, who's gonna make my boiling point go higher? NaCl. You're right, why? Well, they're both soluble, but if I've got a mole of NaCl, one mole of NaCl, what does it break apart into? Na plus and <laughs> Cl negative. If I have one mole of glucose, does that break apart into anything? No, it just sticks together as glucose molecules. So already you can see that if I have the same amount of an electrolyte and a non-electrolyte, the one who has more stuff in the way is going to make my what? Boiling point be higher. That's why you have to be aware of your ionic compounds. I could say this, an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte will raise my boiling point more if I had the same amount of each. And you would say, the electrolyte because it breaks apart into more stuff. See, collegiate properties could care less what these particles are. Just the more of them, the more they get in the way of the water, the more water needs more energy to get away from them. Okay, that's boiling point elevation. Let's do freezing point 
and see what happens to the freezing point. Now watch. Here is freezing. Watch very carefully. You can see the crystals on the bottom. Some are melting, some are refreezing. Some are freezing, some are melting. We have both directions. Notice the crystal lattice formation. We've got freezing and melting. Could you see that? If I had the perfect cooler and I did a self sculpture of myself with ice sculpture, I put my bust of my head right into this big cooler that no heat got in. And it was a 10 kilogram ice sculpture of myself, self portrait, ice sculpture. Who doesn't do that? Okay, now, I put that in the cooler because I want to save it for next year's party. No heat gets in. So clearly, the ice should still be there. And it is. But the problem is, will my face still look like me if there's going to be some melting and some refreezing? Over time, the shape of it's going to what? Morph. There's still, if it was a 10 gram piece of ice or 10 kilogram piece of ice, it'd still be 10 kilograms in here if no heat gets in. Now, it's, of course, impossible. Sometimes, with any, every, any good cooler, some heat gets in, and the rate of melting will go faster than the refreezing. But you have both going on. The reason why a cooler prevents you from melting is because you have both going on. You have some refreezing and some remelting. Now, what happens when I put a solute particle in here? Watch this again, party people. Watch. Watch very carefully. Look at the both phases. I've got some melting. I've got some freezing. Both things are going on. It's equilibrium. <coughs> both things are happening. Now I'm going to add some solute particles. Watch what happens. What are the solute particles going to do? What do the solute particles do in the other example? They got in the what? In the way, right. So watch, the solute particles are these light green spheres. They're getting in the way of the water trying to what? Get to the crystal. So the rate of what? The rate of melting is faster than the rate of free freezing. And you notice it's melting. The solid particles are getting in the way. Now, here's a great analogy. <laughs> Look at it, look at it. these solute particles are getting, they're blocking it. These molecules want to freeze, but they can't because these things are getting in the way. So they need a colder temperature to slow these guys down enough so I can get to my position and freeze. Freezing point is depressed. Okay, give me, let me give you this analogy. Think about a squirrel crossing a rope. Okay, I could be that squirrel. What does it do? Okay? And a squirrel trying to cross a busy road has a hard time. Why? Because the solute particles are going too fast. But if I want to get to the other side of the road because this is the place where the crystal is growing, I have a tough time if the, if the molecules of the cars are going too fast. Slow them down, I can get to my crystal position. So freezing point is depressed. What was boiling point? What was boiling point when you add solute particles? Elevated. Freezing point is depressed. Now, where do we see this in our life? Ever hear of antifreeze? What is antifreeze? Antifreeze is something that prevents freezing because it lowers the freezing point so much, you need a colder temperature to freeze. This is an explanation of why does salt melt ice? Why does salt melt ice? Watch, people. Pay attention. Something you should know. Here is ice. Let's say the ice is at zero degrees Celsius. Here's my beautiful piece of ice. It's at zero degrees Celsius. Here's the air temperature around the ice. Let's say it's at zero degrees Celsius. My air temperature. OK. Because the air temperature is at zero, the ice is at zero, does the ice melt? No. What if I make the air temperature go to 10 degrees? No. If it got warmer out? Yeah. Of course. Anytime the air temperature is above the ice's temperature, you'll have melting, correct? Mm -hmm. Watch. By putting salt on ice. OK, let me sprinkle, sprinkle some salt. By putting some salt molecules on the ice. Now I've added some salt. What have I done to the freezing point? 
Freezing point does what? Increase. That's for the boiling. Decrease. Freezing point is decreased. So let's pretend this decreases to negative 10 now. Don't pack up, please pay attention. It's negative 10 degrees. Well, wait a minute. Isn't the air temperature now warmer? And now this starts to melt. But wait a minute, do we need salt? Do I need to, ex do I need to buy expensive rock salt or, no. Couldn't I just sprinkle sugar? It would work. Now, would sugar work as well as NaCl? Or some that breaks apart? No, because you need more of it. Sugar stays together, but sugar, as long as it dissolves, it will get in the way. So, to remember these two things, you have boiling point elevation because the stuff is getting in the way. You have freezing point depression if you want to get into the chemistry party. You knock, and you got to show the guy at the door the symbol. Okay, I don't want to show it here, but you do this. The boiling point is the higher temperature than the freezing, correct? The boiling point is elevated, freezing point is depressed. They just get wider. That's all they do. You add solute particles, this goes up. So if you knock on the door, don't show it around. You do this. Okay, I have a demo for you. Hopefully it works. Now, I have carbonated water. What does carbonated water have in it? What does carbonated water have in it? What does it have in it, party people? Carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is a solute particle. Solute particles do what to the freezing point? By adding solute particles, what happens to the freezing point? It decreases, so therefore it freezes at a lower temperature. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this solute particle and I am going to shake it like a Polaroid picture. No, I'm going to shake it and I'm hopefully this water is at negative 5 degrees Celsius, maybe. I don't know if it's going to work. It's not cold enough. I'll try again tomorrow, but I'll try. So here I have some, I have some, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up and I'm going to shake it. Okay? Now, by shaking it and opening up, right now it's not frozen. This should be about negative 5 degrees Celsius. It's not frozen because the CO2 molecules are what? In its way. By shaking it and letting the CO2 come out, the freezing point will rise and hopefully freeze. Okay, let's see if that happens. Now, it only works if it's cold enough, and I only had it in it for an hour. So here we go. I'm going to shake it. I don't think it's cold enough. One more time. It's a bummer if it's not, but we'll try one more time. It's got to be just right. If I, if I cool it, if it's too cold, it freezes as is. Ah, I think it's just too warm. Ah, here we go. And then, can you see the solids? So by taking out the CO2, the freezing point rose enough so it could start to freeze. What prevented it from freezing in the first place was the stuff that got in its way. Can I, uh... Let me turn it on.